Our next speaker is Marcella Wood. He's at the University of California, Irvine. The title of his talk is Circadian Gene Regulation by Histone Deacetylation Contributes to Age-Related Impairments in Memory and Synaptic Plasticity. Great. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, um, thanking Molly and, and all the uh, supporters of this wonderful meeting so far. So uh, I'll be speaking a little bit about molecular mechanisms um, in a mouse, not the mouse. And uh, we, we, we have encountered some SNPs in C57s, which we always have to screen for, which is scary. So my uh, lab works on trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory, um, mostly in the young uh, adult brain, or more recently in the aging brain, and we also work on drug-seeking behavior. And most of the time, we're interested in understanding um, what's happening here at the level of the epigenome. And there are two kind of amazing things that happen at the level of the epigenome. So the first thing is, if you took all your chromosomes and unraveled them and laid them uh, end to head, uh, all lined up, you'd have about six feet of genomic material that you have to squeeze into this microscopic nucleus. And that's a level of compaction of about 10,000-fold to be on the conservative side. And so that 10,000-fold that level of compaction is staggering and kind of difficult for us to conceptualize. So when you think about the genes that you have to turn on and off in order to get specific neuronal function, it becomes a really difficult task for any cell to do that. And so we need all sorts of higher-order molecular mechanisms to access, index, and turn on the right genes, turn off the right genes for neuronal function. The other really cool aspect of this is that the epigenome serves as a signal integration platform that can literally encode experience and the environment, uh, your diet, uh, uh, extraordinary levels of stress, all these things can be encoded at the level of the epigenome and in some cases can be transmitted transgenerationally, uh, which is uh, an area of investigation in epigenetics that a lot of people are jumping into, but those experiments are extremely difficult to prove uh, transmission mode. And so the overall working hypothesis that we have is that chromatin regulatory enzymes control gene expression that's required for stable changes in neuronal function that give rise to stable changes in, in behavior. And we're interested in histone acetylation. These are um, modifications on the amino terminal tails of histone proteins. These proteins are one of the most evolutionarily conserved proteins that we know of, but there's vast post-translational modification that occurs on these tails. And histone acetyl transferases, like CBP, um, acetylate these tails, open up chromatin structure. It's kind of like allowing the chromatin to breathe. That facilitates gene expression. And the reverse is carried out by histone deacetylases that return you to this more repressive chromatin structure and turn uh, gene expression off. And so early studies uh, by Dave Sweat's lab demonstrated that histone acetylation was dynamically involved in regulating gene expression for memory. I remember when I put it in my first postdoc fellowship, I had switched from cancer uh, epigenetics to uh, neuroscience to study learning and memory and try and understand epigenetic mechanisms in learning and memory. And when I turned in my first fellowship, I was uh, unanimously told by reviewers, chromatin is purely static. That's a, it just gets your genome into a nucleus and that's it. And, and so transformative work by Sweat's lab and others have, have really broken open the idea that it's a very dynamic process that encodes immense amounts of information. Um, we published a paper with Ted Abel's lab looking at histone deacetylase inhibitors. These HDAC inhibitors can transform memory, uh, enhance memory, enhance synaptic plasticity in, in really unusual ways. Um, at, up until that point, about 2007 or so, we didn't really know what HDACs were involved. Um, clearly, the, the aging field knows about the sirtuins, uh, SIR2 and Lenny Garenti's work and yeast and, and C. elegans. Um, uh, we've been focusing on HDAC3, histone deacetylase 3. This is one of the most dominantly expressed um, HDACs in the brain and um, counteracts the activity of the histone acyl transferase CBP that we work on. And so HDAC3, uh, one of the first studies we published demonstrated that it's a very powerful negative regulator of memory. This is, it's like a molecular brake pad. It sits on chromatin and shuts it down into this repressive state. And you have to overcome that in order to turn genes on from memory. 
And, and when you do disable HDAC3, you can get really unusual things happen to, to memory and synaptic plasticity. You can transform a sub-threshold learning event, so a learning event that would not be encoded in short-term or long-term memory, now can be encoded into long-term memory very robustly. You can also generate a form of long-term memory that persists beyond the point at which normal memory would fail. So this is a really unique um, negative regulator, this molecular brake pad uh, for memory. And, and here we put forth this uh, molecular brake pad hypothesis where we reviewed all the literature in this field. And HDACs and co-repressors really seem to have this function of shutting chromatin down. And, and perhaps if, if you extended this hypothesis and uh, way out, um, you could say that this is potentially a molecular mechanism by which uh, your brain is prevented from encoding everything that you experience into memory because clearly we have to be selective about what we encode. So then um, in, in 2010, Carol Barnes and Dave Sweat put forth this hypothesis that epigenetic mechanisms might be dysregulated in the aging brain and that might be giving rise to age-dependent uh, um, memory impairments. And so um, recently we've been going after the question, um, is HDAC3 misregulating gene expression in the aging brain? Is HDAC3 somehow uh, incorrectly repressing genes in the aging brain and, and giving rise to memory impairments? And so I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through all the background that suggests that this could be true. We know that there's transcriptional dysregulation in the aging brain. There have been some uh, pot shots at taking a look at, at the different mechanisms that might be involved in trying to understand and characterize the epigenome that might be misregulated. Um, but we really don't know a whole lot, and I'll come back to those opportunities at the end. So we've been looking at HDAC3. One way to do this is using um, genetically modified mice that are floxed, so we can introduce a virus that expresses CAMK2 Cree. This causes a deletion of these exons, and you get complete loss of HDAC3 expression, and this is in dorsal CA1 of the hippocampus. We also um, use AAV viruses to express a point mutant of HDAC3. So the, the HDAC3 has this really powerful deacetylase domain, and you make one little amino acid substitution there, and you shut that activity down. But this protein can still interact with all of its protein-protein interactors. And so we can deliver that um, to the dorsal hippocampus as well. So we have two different ways to modify HDAC3. And there are, there's also a, a very powerful pharmacological uh, approach, which I won't get to. So here, um, we're looking at the ability of uh, deleting HDAC3, removing this molecular brake pad, and the effect on memory. And we usually use a very simple task called object location memory. Um, Sarah Burke uses a, a, a modified version of this. Uh, so this is very simple. Uh, 10 minutes of training to two identical objects. 24 hours later, an object is moved to a new location. Your dorsal hippocampus really, really cares about that. And so in a young animal, uh, 10 minutes of training gives you this really nice uh, discrimination index. Um, here uh, we have aged wild-type litter mates. Uh, they have very poor long-term memory, uh, whereas if you remove HX3, you get this really nice long-term memory for the uh, familiar location of the object. And that happens whether you focally delete HDAC3 or you throw in a dominant negative and inactivate its function. So then we wanted to look at synaptic plasticity. And I'm, I'm not going through all the other work, just taking a, a couple highlights from the, the project here. And, and again, we deliver the virus to the dorsal hippocampus. So these are the floxed mice where we deliver uh, AAV CAMK2 CRE to generate the focal deletion in the dorsal hippocampus or the dominant negative. And here we're delivering it to just one side and then the control virus to the other side so we can do within animal uh, control. And then we're looking at theta burst stimulation in the Schaefer collateral pathway. And so here, uh, as has been seen by numerous labs, uh, young hippocampus shows really nice strong potentiation. If you um, throw in the point mutant of HDAC3, you get this super induction, uh, really nice enhanced potentiation. In the old, uh, in the aging brain, so these animals are between 18 and 20 months old, um, there's a failure to maintain potentiation. So you get the early phase of LTP, 
which seems to be transcription dependent, but the late phase and maintenance of transcription um, completely decays. And that can be rescued by the point mutant of HDAC3. But as you can see, you can rescue it to the level of the young animal, but we can't get this super induction, probably because of the mechanisms that, that Carol Barnes and, and Michaela Gallagher have, have uh, described in the past. We see the same thing with the HDAC3 uh, focal deletion in these other animals. And there are no changes in, in other aspects of basal synaptic transmission. So um, then we wanted to know about gene expression. And this was really where we were headed. And so we took HDAC3 uh, floxed animals and compared to the young wild type. There's the old uh, wild type and then the old HDAC3 flox. We wait two weeks for the virus to generate the focal deletion. And then we put them through 10 minutes of training. An hour later, we collect tissue. And we did a bunch of uh, RNA sequencing. Uh, this next generation sequencing with Pierre Baldi to help us with the data analysis at UC Irvine. And um, I'm just going to focus on, on a set of four genes. So these are genes that they went up in the young animal. They failed to go up in the aging brain. And they were rescued by the focal deletion of HDAC3. And so naively, we thought we would get a, much, a, a, a pattern of genes that much more looked like what the young animal had. Instead, we got a very small handful that came up. And, and you see some of the typical players, like the NR4A genes, uh, EGR1, which Tom Foster showed. Uh, and the one that struck out to us was period one. And so period one, this is typically a component of the uh, circadian um, uh, clock re regulatory mechanism in the su suprachiasmatic nucleus. But remember, the manipulations we're making are specifically to the dorsal hippocampus in these experiments. And so does hippocampal per one link aberrant epigenetic re repression with impaired memory and impaired circadian rhythms? One of the first experiments we did was to make sure that uh, the, the uh, circadian rhythm wasn't affected in these animals with a focal deletion of HDAC3 in the dorsal hippocampus. So again, we generate a focal deletion, wait two weeks, uh, train and train the animals to two weeks of uh, light-dark cycle, and then leave them for three weeks in the dark. And we saw no differences in, in their uh, period. So it doesn't look like we're affecting the circadian rhythmicity uh, by this focal deletion in the, just the dorsal hippocampus. So then we wanted to look a little bit more at the molecular aspects of this and getting really at the mechanism. I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Here, this just shows that um, when we, um, so in the aging brain after object location training, there's no increase of period one like there is in the young brain, but that's rescued by this HDAC3 focal deletion. We know that um, the promoter region of period one has a Cree element and an EBOX that's bound by CREB. Uh, here's Quark and BMOL, uh, the histonocell transfer CBP. And we were wondering, OK, is HDAC3 also physically bound to that promoter to better understand the mechanism? And sure enough, um, HDAC3 occupancy is found to be reduced after training in, at all three sites. So it's that molecular brake pad is coming off of period one during memory encoding. And that correlates with an increase in histone acetylation at H4K8, which is a substrate of HDAC3. So is period one uh, necessary for memory? It's induced by object location memory. It's induced by contextual fear to hippocampus dependent tasks. And if you knock it down, using sRNA, you completely block the formation of long-term memory. And so does HDAC3 limit memory formation in the aging brain through a period one uh, uh, mechanism? And that's kind of the, the million-dollar question that we're dealing with right now. So blocking HDAC3 ameliorates age-related impairments in long-term memory and synaptic plasticity. Um, deleting HDAC3 restores expression of a subset of genes, including period one. And, and it could be this uh, unique mechanism by which epigenetic mechanisms interact with the circadian gene reg mechanisms in a very unique way uh, outside the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this work was all done by uh, a really talented postdoc, Janine Quapis, um, who will be uh, on the job market next year. So shameless plug for her. Um, so a couple current directions. We're, we're currently working with Carl Kottman, uh, looking at a, an exercise, um, the effects of exercise, and the ability of exercise to induce an epigenetic molecular memory 
for that previous experience. And that's exactly what epigenetic mechanisms can do. And this idea was uh, established in part by his wonderful exercise experiments, but also by a simple yeast paper showing that yeast can generate a molecular short-term or long-term memory for a previous experience. Muscle cells can do the same thing. And so bringing these concepts into the aging um, uh, research with exercise. Um, we're also uh, working on a memory updating task. Um, animals don't just learn something de novo. What we all do is we update memory formation. And so we have a, a new task where we can get at that. Um, for lack of a better term, we call it memory updating. And here, we're trying to figure out the role of epigenetic mechanisms in that form, uh, in that process. And we're collaborating with Zeng Min Zhu using these mini scopes. So you can attach these mini scopes. And this is a, a G-Camp 6 uh, mouse running through the object location task. These are neurons that are actively firing. So every time an action potential fires in a given neuron, you can image that. You can um, then, over time, look at um, very specific neurons throughout different stages of learning and memory um, in these animals. And so we're excited because that opens up um, a lot of different questions that then we can address that we simply couldn't do in any other way. These mini scopes, the first paper by Nick Spitzer, that, that mini scope probably cost about a couple hundred thousand dollars when it was first designed. Alcino Silva and others have really made this available to everybody. These are now probably cost like a couple thousand. Um, the hard part's the, so the algorithms to analyze the data, and that's with uh, Zhang Min Zhu. Areas of opportunity, the epigenome and the aging brain, and RNA modification dependent mechanisms. I'll leave it there. I'm out of time. Thank you. Questions, yes. Oh, great talk. So one of the things that I think has come up a few times now is that we haven't really been talking about heritability. So we know that cognitive aging and also disease is highly heritable. Um, and you're talking to us about epigenetics, which I think is really interesting. Um, so one of the things that we focus on a lot at the Jackson Laboratories is to use different um, genetic models in order to sort of understand mechanisms like this. And one of the things that I'm realizing is that in HDAC3, depending on the mouse model that you're using, there's something like 200 naturally occurring variants. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just comment on how um, natural variation in things that are regulating, right, the, the chromatin structure sort of come together to regulate things like cognitive decline and also um, disease pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that wonderful question, and I, I don't even know where to begin to answer that question, honestly. Um, I think that uh, not only is there, uh, so with all the animal strains, there are issues of genetics and SNPs, but also with respect to epigenetics, there's epigenetic drift as we age as well. And that's a concept that everyone's struggling to understand exactly how, as we age, we have just a, a natural shift in how our epigenome uh, is structured. Um, and then how that gives rise to individual variability and aspects of heritability, um, those questions are virtually unanswered still. Yeah, so I just want to make it clear that I don't actually think that genetic variation is a confound, right? I think mm. it's an opportunity I for agree. us to start linking associations to causation, yeah. right? And look at how these variants are are propagating through different biological scales to give us individual differences in cognitive aging and, and AD. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. John. Yeah, uh, nice talk. Thanks. So I noticed when you compare this uh, young age, the RE-seq data, mm -hmm. you know, the, the overlap of the change is very few. Only, you know, most of those gene changes are uh, unoverlapped. Mm -hmm. So of course, when you delete this uh, HDX3, and you see four gene get rescued that way. But on the other hand, look, those you know, age uh, mice, they have completely different gene expression yeah. patterns. So the question is, uh, uh, does that mean not only you lost some loss function, but potentially gain some problem when we are, you know, mouse are, are aging? Have you looked at those uh, age-specific change genes? If you, you know, alter those genes, 
can you uh, rescue those learning memory deficits? Yeah, uh, so yes, great observation, yeah. So we were surprised by the data on many fronts, and, and indeed I think the, the set of genes that you see that are di uh, differentially regulated just between the, the young and the aging mm -hmm. brain um, were not exactly what you would expect to see, and we're only starting to mine that data to see what else is in there. Um, we have looked at the nuclear orphan receptor genes. Those are immediate early genes and transcription factors. They also can rescue age-dependent memory. One Remember. quick question, yes. Yeah. Um, so Phyllis Z and her colleagues have shown that exercise improves circadian rhythm and sleep, especially in aging humans. So I'm wondering if uh, from your perspective, some of the uh, studies that show uh, correlations between uh, exercise and cognition might rather be exercise and circadian rhythm and better sleep and therefore improve cognition. Yes, exactly. I, I, I do think they, they really could be. And, and that's one of the reasons this work has been kind of exciting because it, it sheds a new interpretation on, on some of these things. Yep. Thank you very much.